I want to thank uh, Harley and uh, Sophia and uh, Annie uh, primarily for helping uh, install the show. Uh, we did that right when we got back from Christmas break and uh, it was really good to have them uh, work on uh, Professor Nix's uh, photographs. That took a double hanging, uh, primarily because art majors are not math majors, I think. But uh, thank you for your work. That was really important. Um, uh, I teach painting and drawing and also modern art history, uh, some studies in art, and this semester I'm teaching a Luke Scholars course in uh, modern, survey of modern art. Um, and the work in the show that I've made uh, include these black drawings here on the back wall, as, where, as well as the gray framed small squares that measure 22 by 22 inches. And uh, I, I won't talk a lot about this, but um, for those of you who don't know much about my work, I will just say a little bit about the way that I, the way that I, the way that I work, I guess. Um, but you can see in this, most of these have this kind of a diagram, <coughs> uh, hexagonal pattern, which I've worked with on and off uh, for over 10 years and uh, I finally decided I really wanted to bring this into some smaller works and I wanted to work with color and I really think of the hexagon as a fr friendly kind of shape. Uh, you put one hexagon down you can lock it in with six, uh, with six sides, it's easy to kind of add uh, and subtract and, uh, and I think the hexagon not only, not only is friendly but also as healthy uh, because it's kind of like a community. And so I really think of these paintings as sites or zones or locations, and uh, I selected to use the square because it isn't vertical like a figure, nor is it horizontal uh, like a landscape, but really I, I want to think of these as looking down above, like a chart, a diagram, a map. And so a lot of the titles uh, have uh, associations with territories, uh, mapping a zone or mapping land. Uh, and I think that has to do with the idea of just finding a location, uh, knowing where you belong, uh, how, what is it that you call home, uh, uh, how much is home associated with the people you know, and how much is home associated with the, uh, the actual land itself. And, um, and I think, you know, we're living in a really political time, not that time has never been political, but for me the idea of shifting borders migrations, refugees, uh, people that are displaced, people that are placed, all that kind of stuff I think is uh, in the back of my mind when I'm working on these paintings. And last uh, year at this time I was in uh, Berlin and uh, the day that, that Ukraine was inv invaded by Russia was the day that they found a World War II bomb in Berlin, in Prenzlauberg and they had to evacuate 9,000 people in that city and move those people out for 48 hours. And so, I, I mean, I think that world uh, and then also the, the immediate kind of location where we live is all affected by the kind of walls that we build and the kind of walls that we open up. And you can see these paintings have a lot of movement in them. They're, they start in a very, uh, how should I say it, a kind of a strange way. They're unfamiliar to me, uh, but through the process of painting uh, and, and reworking and shifting and uh, repainting, I, 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 they become familiar. And I really feel that paintings, at least my paintings, are like uh, a new acquaintance. And I have to spend a lot of time with them. I have to listen to them in order to get to know them. So. That's what I would say about my work. Uh, there's one over here. There's a little some wall. There's some on the wall in the second gallery. Uh, so I don't care who goes next. But. Uh, I'll go. Uh, hey, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Professor Box. I teach uh, illustration, graphic design, printmaking. Um, <coughs> I made this. Uh, <laughs> So for this uh, exhibition, I wanted to create some work uh, that, that related but moved from two-dimensional into three-dimensional, four-dimensional with, with video. Um, so I'll start by talking about the, uh, the prints over there. Sorry to shift attention this way, but um, this series was really created with the, uh, the hope to get to um, play with 
uh, print media in a kind of authentic way. So the, uh, the subject matter here, these portraits are all taken from uh, a single issue of Life magazine, and they started out as these like one by two um, parts of larger images. Uh, some of them were editorial, some of them advertisement. And um, so I scanned those in at a high resolution so that I could blow them up to the scale that you see here. Um, and that was really in order just to uh, accentuate the halftone pattern that was creating the continuous tone illusion um, in the magazine itself. So um, those then, after being scanned, were printed out so that I had a, an artifact to work with. <laughs> And um, I wanted to distort that in a physical way. And so in re-digitizing these, um, I scanned them, each one again, two times. And as it was scanning, I sort of uh, moved the print around the scanner bed just a little bit so that it would distort the, uh, the half tone that existed there. And um, like I said, I did it twice. So I scanned it once, moved it a little. I scanned it a second time, tried to move it in a slightly different way. So like the distortion that you see in these images um, <clears throat> is like a physical um, distortion. It's not like warping things in Photoshop or anything like that. That said, once they're digitized, um, I played around with them in Photoshop, silhouetted things, cropped things a little bit, and then added um, some symbols because uh, Typographic forms are really interesting just as, as, as graphics, but they're also interesting because they're symbols and they don't really mean anything inherently, but you know, we've associated meaning with them through repetition and you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, semiotics, right? So um, that's just a word that I wanted to know. <laughs> um, so uh, sort of chosen at random here, I'm working with some letter forms, some uh, Punctuation, uh, there's a Q and a K as a part of it, and those are basically just chosen for their aesthetic quality. And so I decided that um, one of the scanned uh, iterations of the portrait would stay complete, and then the other one I would crop in a, uh, a way. They, they all sort of get close to center, but not quite center, like some are slightly above center but then crop in a way and I would um, juxtapose these letter forms as um, a part of the continuation of that uh, color. So then they're, they're printed in um, process cyan and process magenta, which are two of the four color process printing. And they um, are uh, semi-transparent so you can see one of the inks through the other and it kind of forms other color um, as they optically blend. And so, <clears throat> Um, that then is uh, printed onto MAP, and I've been working with MAPs for quite a while with my printmaking uh, because I really enjoy the, uh, you know, the layering not only of like meaning, but also just the visual aesthetic layering of these unrelated uh, image elements. So the MAPs, uh, I think, come from like the early 50s or late 40s. Um, the, the imagery is from a 1966 publication. Um, so they're both sort of, um, you know, pre-exist me, and so <laughs> uh, I like the idea of working with material that I don't have a direct kind of um, connection to, and so it's like kind of a, a borrowed nostalgia, or um, in my work I like to think about it um, sometimes as a, like borrowing memories, like other, other people's memories. Um, and, and then that, I think, also relates to the use of these portraits in kind of an interesting way because it's not about who these people are anymore because I would imagine that most of them um, have passed by now or if they are still alive are very different people than they were when the um, 1966 publication was taken. So it's not about who they are um, or about um, like identifying the individual in the portrait but it's more about like the idea of, of who that person might have Ben, and there's, there's room, I think, to uh, sort of build narratives as you look at them, hopefully. Um, so that's, that's those five pieces over there. And um, related to that is this um, large uh, letter A. <laughs> um, I wanted to do uh, a mixed media 
uh, installation. You guys are fine, you can see that. <laughs> Uh, a mixed media installation and I wanted to projection map onto uh, an object and so I had to create an object and what better than a giant letter A and then you know by like turning it upside down and sort of uh, subverting um, its, its initial orientation and, and usage it uh, again sort of thinking about that idea of unfamiliarity it presents uh, a way where we can maybe appreciate the form um, for its just aesthetic qualities. And then um, I spray painted a little bit because if it's coming out of my studio, it's gonna have spray paint on it probably, so I thought <laughs> might as well lean into that. And I actually just wanted some kind of a, uh, a visual that was a part of the letter form so that the uh, video could interact with that. And so this is a like a 10 minute loop um, that includes some of my printmaking. Um, and uh, so there's some textures and things from like prints that I've done. It's not those prints, but other prints where I'm layering up lots of different colors and images. And then the other sort of uh, element within this is random pages from the 1966 Life magazine um, scanned in at a high resolution so that I could just sort of crop in on certain areas. Um, and part of that is to create a a direct relationship between those um, these two bodies and the other um, reason for doing that is just to accentuate again that halftone pattern and um, the more a pattern that can kind of happen sometimes with uh, the four color process so um, How did you go about the selection from your life magazine How, what was your criteria yeah of selection uh, I tried not to think about it too much to okay. be honest um, I, I had torn out, um, this really all started with another project that I just wanted collage uh, material to work with and so I had gone through and torn out um, pages that I thought were interesting and so this was kind of just um, going through that stack and, and pulling images at random and um, uh, I wasn't exactly sure how um, compositionally things would fit on the form and so actually I put the, um, the video together um, or the, the digital collage together and then I came into the space once uh, the letter form was set up and I cropped um, or masked out uh, the negative spaces around it so that the video would just exist on the form itself. So the compositions are kind of a little bit of uh, chance and serendipity. Yeah, any other questions? Thank you for the question. Yeah. Why did you put it up against a wall? <clears throat> okay, yeah, fair. Um, <laughs> I, I thought it would be interesting, um, anytime you present something, you know, it's affected by the, the context of the space that it's in. And so um, I was really interested in uh, presenting this as a um, kind of a disruption of the architectural uh, environment in a way, and then also, on a more practical, um, you know, maybe this is tipping my hand a little bit too much, the sheets of the material, I was building it out of a four by eight, and I wanted to use the full four, or the full, full eight, and so it ended up cropping off part of the A. Um, I looked at it in some different orientations where it was like laying on the floor um, with that cropped area, but I liked the idea of the letter form moving into a, a wall or into a space. Um, it reads a lot differently in this space because there's a lot of uh, empty space around it, but in my studio it had quite a presence with like the nine foot ceilings that were just barely, you know, taller than that and just all this stuff that's in that, that area as well. So. Yeah. Anything else? Megan wanted me to tell you guys that she named this piece Alignment, um, so... Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I'm going to stop talking now. I'm sorry it went so long. Um, if you do have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you individually, and um, I will introduce whoever is speaking next. You, you did great. He needs no introduction. It's Don <clears throat> Robson, <laughs> department chair. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I, I thank you too. I, 
because you're giving your time and you're listening, I think. Um, and I, uh, Isabella, would you remind me to come back to that in a little bit because I'll probably forget. I've been talking a lot about the idea of listening and giving of time. Um, and it relates a lot to these pieces. I also want to apologize if I'm in a certain light that I'm blinding you from my tall forehead. But it is a superpower as well. Um, thank you for the laughter, the humility. Um, I have a, uh, two different bodies of work here. And really, uh, I don't know if I want to talk that much about um, the story behind them. I, I'll give an overview, and then I will entertain questions if you have them. But I want to focus a lot on process, too, because that's really important to me. Uh, but both bodies of work, and I think even uh, probably since um, art school as an undergraduate, I've really been interested in the idea of relationships, and uh, more so the ones that are the inherent challenges to relationships, because I think uh, those are the ones that force us to think harder or give up altogether or try harder. And also, I'm a pessimist, but I'm an optimistic pessimist. Um, thank you, Stan. I'm glad you're here. Uh, um, but I, so I was thinking about this idea of relationships, and I talk about it a lot. And then I thought uh, a while back that I really never invite anyone into my studio, um, and I don't talk that much about my work unless I think people really want to know. And part of that's just vulnerability. Um, and so I thought, well, that's kind of. This seems kind of ironic if I'm so interested in relationships, why do I not bring people in that much? And so um, since I've been here, it's my 14th year here, I've collaborated three times. And so the body of work here, they're sort of out and about, was with uh, my friend Brooke Gatman, who's here, who's also a former student. And um, I, I think what brought us together on this, I have this book called Modern House in my library. And I, I think the houses are really interesting, but I was really intrigued by the blueprints that are in there that support the, the finished piece. And I thought I'd want to do something with those one day, but I didn't know what. And then in getting to know Brooke, one of the things that we have in common is uh, kind of the idea um, behind house and home and uh, the relationships that are in that space and whether you think about it as a house or a home. And so we kind of worked together a little bit. And my, my part in this was to uh, it was not fun, um, but it was good for me. It was cutting out all of these blueprints. And because I don't really work that way, it's tedious and I just don't like it. But it was good for me to do that, I think. Um, and this, this paper that it's on is uh, coated with asphalt. And so it reacts to heat and it, it can smudge very easily. And we purposefully wanted to keep the space around white to bring about, uh, I think, along with the, the uh, blueprints and the white is kind of that sterility that might cause you to think about house over home. And then Brooke, who I think is a really fantastic mark maker, she brought in these images from childhood, which I think supported the idea more of home. And so within these compositions and the red dots that you see in here, the red dots to me is the confrontation of home and house. And the blueprints, again, are house, and the child um, toy images or drawings are, are home. And so there's that tension in there, I think. And so, um, uh, Brooke, you want to say anything about these? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll leave those at that. And then I have the figurative pieces as well throughout. And uh, it's interesting to hear my colleagues talk uh, because um, I heard shared things with uh, Jim and Seth so far that I was thinking about a lot with the figurative pieces. And um, I knew I wanted to do another body of work with figures. I just didn't really know what they were going to be yet. And so this will kind of go into the research, and then I'll go back to just a little bit behind those pieces. But um, when I was an undergrad, uh, we didn't, the, the internet wasn't around. And so to research that wasn't a, a, an opportunity or possibility. And so I spent a lot of time in the library reading about artists and becoming inspired by certain ones. And then also, and I still like this, but I like to go to the antique shops and junk stores and just you know, kind of look around. But really I think uh, what was always kind of uh, inspiring to me, and again, I think Seth said serendipity, but serendipitous to me was 
not always looking for something, but something would find me or I might find it. And, and there, was a, there was a possibility. I didn't know what it was, but so I was looking around in Lincoln at this place and there was a basket full of these pieces of acrylic and most of them had letters. And I thought they were great, but I didn't really make a connection too much with them. But I found five that had mathematical symbols. So a period and a minus sign, and well, not all mathematical, but a period, minus sign, percentage sign, cent sign, and a comma. And so I started thinking about what do those things mean? And then I, I, I think I know what they mean, but I went back and researched them anyway. And then I started to uh, recontextualize the definition a little bit and what could they mean uh, in relationship to these figures. And the figures to me, I, what I'm calling these five images are the less desirables. I, I uh, too, as Professor Bachelman alluded to, a little bit of just the things that are going on. I have felt really disheartened the last three years about uh, humanity or the lack of it. And I'm concerned that we're not going to get back to a place that we were before. Not that it was perfect, but right now I just don't even know sometimes. And it affects me deeply uh, in relationships. And so I thought about um, how things are so politicized now, and if we don't ag agree with someone or they don't agree with us, then we don't want anything to do with them. And so I started thinking about how these mathematical or grammatical symbols fit with images and uh, tried to tie that symbolically back into what these figures might represent or what they would go through uh, to just exist. And so, I don't know why now I ask you to remind me of time and listening. I'm listening. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I know what it is. I think, I think we all have the ability to listen and uh, give of our time. And if we did, I think a lot of the stuff would be very different. And I'll leave it at that. So if you have any questions or later, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. So uh, my name is Aaron Nix, and uh, I'm a professor here. And I teach uh, photography and video production and various digital media classes. And um, these photos in front of you represent uh, tens of thousands of miles driven across this country with my family. Um, it's an unintended body of work, and so it's really hard to talk, talk about or sort of formulate my thoughts. I really just wanted to walk in this room and go, these are trees, and walk out. really <laughs> wanted to do that, uh, but I thought I would be, uh, it'd be a disservice to you and to me as well. So I wrote down thoughts, and which is really weird for me because uh, I just... I usually just talk from, from uh, whatever's first in my mind, and my students are probably thinking, thank God Professor Nix has written down his thoughts for today, because I'm not so scatterbrained. I'll be a little scatterbrained. Okay, so also, because this represents many years, I really didn't know how I wanted to approach this. Um, I just thought, like, well, how is this personal to me? And how are these trees and these interactions really personal to me? So I got personal. Um, so. Uh, you're not a tree. You're not a tree. Emily, my wife, who's here, um, spoke these words to me <laughs> on a recent car trip <laughs> this past summer, uh, coming back from our vacation, uh, tent camping throughout Washington State. And um, we had been arguing about nothing of importance, as couples do, right? And um, that stopped me in my tracks. It, it shook me to my core because, uh, for many reasons, um, she knew, she's known that in recent years I've taken a great liking to trees or sort of developed a great understanding of trees from reading books to watching documentaries to doing detours to go see trees, to take photos of trees, to sketch of these trees, and I've sort of become mildly obsessed in a non-sort of scientific way. <laughs> okay? um, and she also knew I've been going through a lot this past year mentally, professionally, and just really struggling this past summer, so I was getting to a tipping point. And um, I think by her saying this was um, to have me open up. And sometimes it's really hard for me to open up or have me realize that I'm, I'm valued or, or that I have feelings and I have a life and I'm not stationary. And to have somebody in your life that loves you that much to sort of call you out and the one the best for you is, is, is precious and truly a gift. And, 
Um, but here's what's really strange that fascinates me is that earlier that morning, that same morning, I'd been packing up the van, getting in the car for a, I don't know, 16 hour road trip. And uh, I wrote in my travel journal, um, trees are like people. <laughs> and uh, I had, I don't know why, I had just been, I had been uh, thinking about it, I mean, thinking about the interactions. I've been reading a lot about how trees communicate and uh, how trees uh, support and build entire ecosystems. And I wrote that because, and the whole day I was thinking about that, right before the argument, before uh, she wrote, she said, you're, you're not a tree. And I couldn't help but like, ground myself in this, that she said this, and I wrote this early that morning, and I'm not trying to imply that trees are people, or that we should treat them like people, but maybe we, if we stopped and saw them as more than just a tree, hence my title, it's just a tree, right? Um, these are my visual journals of places and trees that I thought were funny, and sad, and heartbreaking, and just weird, or interesting, and, um, when I would approach a tree, I would really observe it or study it, maybe sketch it, maybe journal about it, maybe simply take a photo, maybe sit with it, maybe smell around here, pay attention. So these are my general journals, right? Or a portion of these journals. And when I see these photos, I think about the smell of the air. I think about the surrounding conversations that I was having that day. I think about my first impressions. And I think about the old adager saying, if you want to be a smart aleck, you'd say, like, you know, take a picture to last longer when you want to tell somebody to buzz off, right? The ironic thing is that by taking these photos, many of these trees are going to outlive me and the existence of this photograph for maybe hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? And that just astounds me that these, these beings, these living creatures are going to outlive me and this existence of the photograph. So it really kind of calls into this question of, the purpose of photography, right? The idea of truth, the idea of permanence, the idea of am I representing reality here? Um, and my argument is that I'm, I'm not, right? Um, and I'm not certain about the age of all these trees. Uh, some of the more celebrity trees or bigger trees, so like the General Sherman tree, right? It's the biggest tree in the world by volume. Um, arguably one of the most famous, famous trees in the world at Sequoia National Park in California. And you walk up the street and you can't you can't ignore it. It's just a behemoth that will just stop you in your tracks and it will be like nothing you've ever experienced in your life. And um, it's said to be anywhere from uh, 2,200 years old to 2,700 years old, um, and which, may be, which means it may be the oldest living thing I've ever seen in my life, right? To recognize the oldest living thing. That's still, it's still striving, it's still maybe under threat from current or more recent wildfires. Um, but I think that is just amazing to sort of be able to claim it or know it and be in the presence of it um, is, is humbling, right? To know that it's been around since the birth of the Roman Empire. Okay. Um, and the, the, the way it humbles you, I think, is, is, is what I love. Wendell Berry says that humility is the primary virtue of good forestry. And I think being humble when I approach something like this that has memories, that has a recording of these memories through its trunks and through its, through its life, I think is important. It makes me think about how I approach a person, right? And get to spend time and get to know somebody. And understanding that these photos will never do these trees justice. That's not my intent. It's not my intent to take the most beautiful photos in the world. Um, we talk a lot about the purpose and context of photography as a medium in my classes and how a photo should be an exact replication of reality or it shouldn't be equated with the idea of truth, um, or even our own eyesight. Um, so this is, these are interpreted memories, right? Same as my sketch of the tree, the same if I had painted the tree or done a sculpture of the tree. These are interpreted memories, um, all of which you could probably buy online of General Sherman, if you just Google General Sherman, if you really want a painting of that or something really, really nice. But that's my memory. That's our memory from that time. But my only memories aren't associated with just this photo. Right? My memories go, go beyond that. This is just a portion of it. And maybe it sort of reflects memories. And I think photos and memories are, are usually sort of associated with each other. And I think that's beautiful. But I think also making a clear divide about what this is and what it isn't is, is also a healthy thing for photography and for our own memories. Right? We live in a world where we're saturated with video content, photography content, and yada, yada, yada. It's, but it's... Um, 
yeah, I think understanding the value of your own memory is, is really impactful too. And that's weird for me to say as a photographer, it puts a lot of value in my images, right? Um, let me find my place. Okay, so as I got to know these trees, and maybe this, even the General Sherman, or as a park ranger I met lovingly called the Jenny Sherman, because he was in protest to the idea that we name trees, especially like famous trees. Um, the, I would consider a friend, or think about it in the same ways that I would approach a friend and get to know, albeit a very famous, famous friend, well-known friend. Um, but some of these trees I've met hundreds of times. Right? Some of these trees I didn't take a photo until years after walking by it every single day. Right? I think about this tree on campus. I think about oh my Dr. Seuss tree that's no longer here on campus. Right? Some, some are no longer here. Some have uh, been here for hundreds of years. I think about uh, this tree, Rocky Mountain National Park, that when I see it, it signifies that I'm here. That I can be and I can be still. And what it can mean to me is, is so much. Um, I think it's ironic that I love trees so much because I live in Nebraska. <laughs> and uh, we literally have a holiday that's for planting trees. And I just, I like that. I like that I have to travel to see some of these great things, but also appreciate what's, what's local. Um, so you'll see things from Seward County, you'll see things from as far as Japan, um, where I traveled last month. Traveling and exploring is one of my greatest joys in my life. Um, I never planned on showing trees for this art show. It sort of developed over time. I, I, and I like that I never took, most of these photos I never took, um, or I didn't think about them in a more professional way. A lot of these are taken on my cell phone, right? And sort of the implication that with the cell phone it's a bit more casual, it's a bit more friendly, right? It's a bit more impromptu. And uh, so a lot of these are taken on cell phones. Some of these are taken on professional full frame cameras or on film or what have you. Um, but that's not what I was thinking about. I was thinking about my experience with that tree and how I saw it or didn't see it. Um, which goes against my nature as an artist. Like I'm always teaching what's the best quality that you can do. Right? What's the best quality that you can achieve as an artist, as a, as a maker? Um, so I like that some of these are taken on my cell phone. And it seems more friendly. Um, I decided to stick with these all or pick only images that are in vertical orientation, sort of uh, equalize them, um, and, and draw connections through the order, the organization. I'm thankful for Professor Bachelman. He talked about uh, the hanging of these, the curation of, of these, and um, student workers who worked on these did a really good job. Um, I even like the two images over there in the wall that were separated. Um, I originally didn't think of that, about them separated, but uh, those two images, uh, one which is in Seward, Nebraska, just at the Walmart, and one is at the Arashiyama Bamboo Forest in Kyoto, Japan. So one is local as you, I don't know if this was the intent with Professor Balkan, but one is local as you can get, one is as far away in this world as you can get, but both on the outskirts of their respective cities, right? One sort of the, showing the pinnacle of American consumerism, and one is um, as you exit an alleyway, go down uh, 20 feet, all of a sudden you're surrounded by this lush, deep bamboo forest um, that's otherworldly. Right? And they really kind of juxtapose, juxtapose each other quite nicely. And that was, um, I thought that was lovely. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll conclude, I'll stop talking. But I just want to say, uh, so I, I may not be a tree, and, but Emily's words uh, meant a lot to me for my, how I could give context to what I deeply care about and how I view myself and how I view myself in this world. And, um, so when I wrote Trees Are Like People, I saw trees as more than just friends because I was starting to see myself as a tree and how my relationships grow. And I think changing or altering my point of view to how I am needed and how I need others in a community, I think is really, really important in my life. Um, to con continue living and giving and receiving and loving <laughs> in a community in today's world. And then Professor Robson was talking about World, our world today, and Professor Bachman was talking about our world today, but living in a community in today's age and time is like living in the increasingly small percentage of forests that are considered old growth. Right? The idea that something could live for 200 or 300 or 400 years old is so rare in this world that we've either not destroyed or we don't allow to grow to do that. Right? So I look at it the same way as a community. Um, 
I want to live to old age, and I want to be a patriarch or matriarch, much like some of these trees can be. Peter Volubin says, a tree can only be as strong as the force that surrounds it. And I really deeply believe that, um, that we all need a forest around us. A cushy forest floor made of wisdom and vibrancy of our forebears, parents and mentors to raise, feed, and teach us conflict, disease, fire, pests to strengthen and prepare us, peers to stretch out and grow with, and sunlight to look for and inspire toward. Um, so I'm talking about myself as a tree. So maybe, maybe I am a tree, or rather, we're all trees or like trees, standing here for as long as we can with each other, doing our best to make it through. And um, I need my friends around me, and I know you do too, every day. Um, so I just want to thank you all for being here and supporting me. And um, thank you especially to Emily, my boys, for being here and for being there every day. Um, I've taken too much of your time, but I would welcome any questions that you have, um, maybe after Professor Groth speaks. So thank you. All right, well, uh, I guess I'm the last person, so you know, I'll round out the dance. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, I guess, uh, sorry, first thing I'll uh, start with is uh, there's this quote from Tony Cragg, British sculptor. He says, I move, it moves. And, and he's talking about his relationship and why he likes, likes working with clay. And so you see in my art statement, I kind of reflect on this idea a lot. And I sort of wrote like a nice little uh, a poem at the end there. Um, and uh, it, it sort of reflects uh, what I would say probably many artists, but you know, it, all my peers who, who have uh, gone through working with the ceramics, clay, um, feel uh, why we really appreciate, say, working with, with uh, the, that malleable material clay, right? Is that direct response relationship of moving and it moving. But, you know, there's some resistance there. Um, I won't bore you with all the sort of thought and insightful research that I put into this over the years. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's just that simple sort of a, a relationship that brings you back to the studio, but also sort of like ground you in reality, right? So I, I tell students all the time, it's like, man, I, I, it, I convict you as much as I convict myself when I say, like, man, I'm living in a digital world too much. And, and touching material and responding is something that's just really grounding it and wonderful. So that's the, the, the sort of starting place, right? Uh, the, the, the making practice, the working practice is just is moving material. And moving material in such a way that um, I'm not trying to directly f affect what's going to happen, and I don't have some sort of predetermined outcome, um, but it's just sort, of, just sort of moving. And then in that sort of open state of, of creating, allowing the ideas to sort of flow and the, the forms to the, the change and move shape, and then um, eventually you get to a point, it's like, okay, well, you made a blob, what do you do with that? <laughs> That's a really hard question because abstract blobs are kind of hard to uh, justify in a lot of contexts, you know, especially with children. You know? What's that, Dad? It's art. Um, <laughs> you'll get it one day, don't worry. <laughs> um, but I do, I, I, I do think of uh, there being some openness uh, for interpretation, certainly, but I do have uh, ideas or means attached to it. But um, part of what my practice has sort of led me to is, is sort of building out, uh, if we just kind of look at this one, um, context or, or presenting it in such a way that it, it, it brings um, part of what I'm thinking, part of what I'm getting after. Uh, and so some of the other things that start um, informing why I make the decisions is uh, this idea of mystery and, and um, so much of our lives and especially like as I've been you know, reflecting, uh, I mean I started the, the practice with the glass for example uh, before the pandemic uh, which you might have heard of before. Um, but even like through all that, like there's a sense of like, man, you, there's a lot of self-examination because you spend a lot of time, and you know, everyone's been going through this, so I don't need to belabor the point. But uh, you know, being here is wonderful, and, and I love being going to chapel, and then like that faith component as one's life is like re reflected in, in like uh, uh, what you do, and and then there's like a deep mystery in that. Like the more you really think about it, so there's some forms, and the glass I think always is going to relate to like you know cathedrals and in that sort of manner. So I use that very intentionally. But then thinking about like, I mean, that's like some really deep mysteries we're asked to just deal with and accept sometimes. 
right? Like uh, if, uh, uh, with you know, Christ dying, right, and rising, it's like, yeah, we can just uh, confess that and say, like, okay, yeah, but it's like, but like, what is that like? And if that's true, which we believe is true, I mean, that's almost and so I kind of reflect this in the title. Like, that's sort of terrifying for me, like, because he asked me to. In, in ways to mimic that, right? And so trying to stare at that, right, and like figure out what that is and, and not quite understand it, you know, you feel like you can get closer, but you have no idea, you can step back and, and you can uh, uh, understand it. And I'm not trying to say, I really understand it a different way. And I'm not trying to say that's exactly what these things are about, but you know, we, we all deal with these sort of mysteries and like, who am I, right? Like, I get a sort of idea about who I am, but if I were to ask my beloved who I am, she might tell me something completely different than I thought, and then I'd have to say, Oh, you're probably right about that. <laughs> uh, that's tough, but fair. <laughs> um, and so uh, this sort of moves, I guess you could say, that the sort of construction that is, is reflecting some of those sort of mysteries and, and like thinking about like what's on the inside that's like hidden from everything, and, but it's almost graspable, but then there's that stuff on the outside that you uh, kind of get, but it's also like sort of moving on you. and, and um, it's maybe not the best looking thing, right? Or uh, there's a sense of like a serpentine movement for me that reflects the sort of like, uh, you know, writhingness. And um, so that's kind of where we get to the form, right? So just to kind of, you know, you came here today, I guess I'll give you a little bit more than just the uh, uh, blurb on the wall. Um, so that's where we get to here. And, and then hopefully trying to, to bring that all together in a really succinct way um, uh, that presents it as like phenomena, right? Uh, and so it's not like reading a, a long passage, and this isn't anything against the literary arts, but uh, you know, art is sort of like there in front of you, and you kind of like uh, you know, see it, uh, like it attacks you, and hopefully then it grips you, and you, you're kind of pulled into it, and you're trying to figure it out. And eventually you get to that sort of point where the attention decays, right? And, and then you just have to you know, move on. You come back, hopefully, maybe you don't, but um, you know, some of these things are, uh, trying to reflect that reality that we sort of live with and, and maybe bring, um, I don't know, some sense of uh, uh, togetherness, right? Like, it's like, yeah, we all kind of deal with that or what does it look like? Um, so that's kind of how we get to the forms. Uh, and then I guess the other thing that I would suppose I address is with the titles, uh, if you looked at them, um, if you know me, uh, I, I never let any opportunity uh, go without trying to make some sort of dumb joke, which is probably a um, character fault. Uh, and for every joke I say, there's probably like 30 jokes. I'm like, you probably shouldn't say that. It's not good timing. Um, you know, so just be you know, accepting that there is a filter. Um, it's, you know, it's still strengthening. Um, it's the beta version. Who knows? Anyway, uh, like the idea of like a cherry on top, right? Which is like, you know, like this sort of sweet thing that makes everything good. And, and it's sort of humorous to call these sort of things like, you know, the cherry on top of everything, right? And um, hopefully it doesn't come across as cynical, but it's like, well, yeah, it's like, you know, at the end of the day, it's like you can spend a lot of time really invested into like trying to figure out all this sort of stuff. Uh, but like maybe, you know, just need to accept it for what it is and like kind of say like, well, that's, you know, joyful or like or there's something here to be learned. Um, or just like you know, to like say like wow that's that's really engaging, um, and uh, not necessarily to be like well who cares right it's a cynical joke that's not what I'm trying to get after. Um, yeah maybe I'll I'll leave it there because uh, otherwise I'll just start rambling and no one wants to listen to me ramble. <laughs> but yeah if you have any questions or. I guess questions for my colleagues. Um, again, thank you for coming. Hope you have a nice rest of your Sunday.